10.5 less than 1 area of a polar region. Our objectives for today are 1. You will understand the development of the integration formula for finding the area of a region bounded by a polar curve and two radial lines, and two, you'll be able to write a definite integral to find the area of a region bounded by a curve and two radial lines. For objective one, how do we develop the integration formula for finding the area of a region bounded by a curve and two radial lines? The development process is the same for any integration formula. You begin with an approximation, you write a Riemann sum to represent your approximation, and then you take the limit of your Riemann sum as the norm of the partition approaches zero, and that will give you a definite integral by definition. So in step one, you're using a pre-calculus formula. Today we're going to use the pre-calculus formula for the area of our representative element, which is a sector of a circle. And then the Riemann sum would give us a sum of areas of n sectors of a circle. And then we take the limit of that Riemann sum, and that would give us our definite integral. So vocabulary that we've seen before is radial line. And we've also seen these vocabulary terms when we looked at the derivation of arc length in section 7.4. You begin with an interval, and you partition that interval to get a number of subintervals. And on each subinterval of the partition, you will have a representative element, a sector of a circle, to approximate the area of the region for that subinterval. The width of the largest subinterval is called the norm of the partition. So let's take a look at the development of the integration formula for finding the area of a region bounded by a polar curve and two radial lines. We want to begin by defining our problem. So what you observe here in this diagram is a polar region sketched on the polar plane. So here's the pole and here we have the polar axis and here traced in blue is the graph of our polar equation given by r is equal to some function of theta and our region of interest whose area we want to find is shaded pink and it is bounded by the graph of our polar curve, it is bounded by our polar curve, the graph of our polar equation, and these two radial lines. The first radial line is here, and let me go ahead and show that in a different color. And the equation for that radial line is theta is equal to alpha. For example, it could be pi over 6 uh, or something else. And here's our second radial line, and the equation for that radial line would be theta is equal to beta. For example, it could be pi over 3 or something else. So the pink region is bounded by these, two real, by these two radial lines and our polar curve. We want to find the exact area of this region, but of course there is no formula in geometry that would give us the exact area of this region. However, we could approximate it by using the formula for the area of a sector of our circle. So our representative element in approximating the area of this region of interest would be the sector of a circle. So what is meant by sector of a circle? You have a circle, this would be the center of the circle. This would be the radius of the circle. And the entire circle would be like this. And you have a sector of a circle here, as I'm showing you now in green. And the central angle 
that determines this sector of our circle is denoted with theta in radians. So how do you find the, a formula for the area of a sector of a circle? You write a proportion, and here's the proportion that you write. You're going to write, for the whole circle, you have an angle of rotation that is 2 pi radians. So you write, for the whole circle, the angle of rotation is 2 pi radians. And the formula for the area of a whole circle is pi r squared. So that's a ratio, and we're going to set that ratio equal to another ratio to form a proportion. Uh, so in the numerator, we have the angle of rotation for the whole circle. So on the right side of this proportion, we will have the angle of rotation for our sector, which is theta. And in the denominator on the left side, we have the formula for the area of the whole circle. And for the denominator on the right side is what we're interested in, the area of our sector. So now we can solve this proportion for A by multiplying both sides of the proportion by A. And we get 2 pi times A. And we can multiply both sides of the proportion by pi r squared and get theta times pi r squared. Or you can say cross multiply. So we're now going to have to isolate a by dividing both sides of the equation by 2 pi. And we get the following. Pi and pi will cancel. So you're just left with 1 half theta r squared. So that's the formula for finding the area of our representative element. Our representative element is the sector of a circle, and the pre-calculus formula for finding the area of a sector of a circle is 1 half theta r squared, where theta is the angle for the sector uh, the central angle of the sector, theta is the central angle of the sector, and r is the radius of the circle of which the sector is a portion. So the next question that we have is, how are we going to partition the interval from theta is equal to alpha to theta is equal to beta? And how are we going to use sectors of circles to approximate the area of the region of interest? We will see that now. So we take our polar region, and here's our radial line theta is equal to alpha. Here's our radial line theta is equal to beta. And we're going to take the interval from alpha to beta and partition it into a number of subintervals. So you can see that here in our diagram where we have the partition points, and the partition points are theta naught is equal to alpha, and then we have theta sub 1, theta sub 2, where theta sub 1 is less than theta sub 2, theta sub 2 is less than theta sub 3, all the way to theta sub n is equal to beta. And what we're going to do here is we're going to approximate a portion of of the area of interest that is in each sub-interval, for example, from theta naught to theta sub 1, or from theta n minus 1 to theta sub n. Uh, we're going to approximate the area of the region of interest on each sub-interval by forming a sector on each sub-interval. So you can see here that 
on our first sub-interval from theta naught to theta sub 1, we have a sector of a circle, and this sector of a circle is approximating the area of the region of interest that lies within the first sub-interval. And we know the formula, the pre-calculus formula for our representative element. Our representative element is a sector of a circle. And we can do this process several times to get areas of several sectors of a circle. And then we can add the areas of these n sectors of circles to get an approximation for the area of our region. That will be our Riemann sum. And then we will take the limit of our Riemann sum as the norm of our partition or the width of the largest subinterval approaches zero, which is equivalent to stating that the number of subintervals will approach infinity. And you can intuitively see that when that happens, uh, as we have more and more sectors, we'll have better and better approximations. And when you take the limit of the Riemann sum, giving you an approximation using n sectors, and you take the limit of that Riemann sum as the norm of the partition approaches zero, that gives you a definite integral, which will give you the exact area of the region of interest. So we will go ahead and take a look at that process. But I'd like to first relate this to what you did in Calculus AB briefly. In, al in Calculus AB, you had a curve given by a rectangular equation, y is equal to f of x, on the interval of x values from x is equal to a to x is equal to b, and you wanted to find the area that was under the curve and above the x-axis between x is equal to a and x is equal to b. And of course, because the curve that forms the top boundary of our region is not a line segment, there is no formula from geometry that would give you the exact area. So you went through the same process that you just saw with approximating the area of a region bounded by a polar curve and two radial lines. You went through the process where you first used a representative element to approximate the area of the region. So your representative element then were rectangles, and you found the area of each rectangle and you added them together to form a Riemann sum. And then you took the limit of the Riemann sum, which gave you by definition a definite integral. And just like you saw with our polar region in Calculus AB, you began by partitioning the interval from x is equal to x is equal x is equal to a to x is equal to b into a number of subintervals. So you had a is equal to x naught, and then you had these partition points x sub one, x sub two, and so on until you got to x sub n minus 1 and x sub n, which was equal to b. And on this partition, which could have been a regular partition if the widths of the subintervals were the same, or a partition that was not regular, uh, you used your representative element, and here's what you did. You place these rectangles, you found the area of each rectangle, and you added the areas of the rectangles together, giving you a Riemann sum, and then you took the limit of that Riemann sum, which by definition gave you a definite integral. For that problem, the width of the ith subinterval, for example, the first subinterval has a width delta x sub 1, 
the width of the nth subinterval would be delta x sub n. And if you have a regular partition, all of these widths would be equal, or if you or they could be different. And when you find the area of each rectangle, you use the precalculus formula. width times height or length times width, however you want to say it. And the width of each rectangle was delta x sub i, where i would represent the rectangle number. So this would be delta x sub 1, this would be delta x sub 4, the way I have it drawn in my diagram. And how do you find the area of a rectangle? You're going to multiply width by height. And the height of each rectangle in our calculus AB problem was given by evaluating your rectangular function at each partition point if you're using a right Riemann sum. So for example, for the first rectangle you can evaluate the rectangular function at the partition point x sub 1, if, and this would give you what we call a right Riemann sum. So look at what I'm about to do here. To find the area of, for example, the first rectangle, you're going to do the following. You're going to evaluate your rectangular function at x sub 1, which will give you the height of the first rectangle, and then you will multiply that by the width of the first rectangle. Height times width gives you area. And you will repeat the process for the second rectangle. You'll evaluate the function at the right endpoint of the subinterval, and then you will multiply that by the width of the second subinterval. And then you will do that for the third rectangle. Evaluate the rectangular function at the right endpoint of the subinterval and multiply by the width of the third subinterval. And then you will do that for the fourth rectangle. Evaluate the function at the right endpoint of the subinterval and multiply by the width of the fourth subinterval. And this is a sum. And let's see if we can write it as a Riemann sum. So now you're going to write a sum using summat summation notation where the index i goes from 1 to, in our particular example, 4, but generally n. You can have n subintervals and n rectangles. So the width of the ith subinterval is given by delta x sub i, and the height of the rectangle formed on that ith subinterval, if we are using a right Riemann sum, would be given by f of x sub i. And you can see that this is a Riemann sum. You have that delta x sub i, which is needed for a Riemann sum. And then you have a sum of products. And of course, you can generalize if you have n rectangles, make it n. And then when you take the limit of this Riemann sum, when you take the limit of this Riemann sum, as the norm of the partition approaches zero, which means the number of subintervals will approach infinity, if this limit exists, then by definition of a definite integral, you get the definite integral from x is equal to a to x is equal to b. The integrand would be f of x, and you're integrating with respect to x. And how do we know that the limit will exist? If you have a continuous function, f of x, continuity of the integrand implies integrability. So this is what we did in calculus AB. We went through this process, and we're going to go through the same process now to derive our integration formula, which will give us the area of a region bounded by a polar curve and two radial lines. So this is where we were, and let's get back to it. And we're going to go ahead and
uh, do the following. To reduce the amount of writing that I have to do, we're just going to divide our interval from alpha to beta into three sub-intervals rather than more than three as you saw previously. So we're going to have alpha is equal to theta naught and then here's our first partition point and here's our second partition point and here's our third partition point. So this is going to be theta sub 1, our partition point, theta sub 2, and we're going to have beta is equal to theta sub 3. What I'd like for you to observe is now on each sub-interval, I will have a sector of a circle, which is my representative element. So here's my first sector. Here's my second sector, and here's my third sector. And you can see what the angle for each sector will be. The angle for the first sector will be the difference between the values of these partition points. Whatever the, the greater angle is, you can subtract from that the value of the lesser angle, and you will find the angle for the sector. It will be theta sub 1 minus theta naught, or more simply, delta theta sub 1. So that's the angle for my first sector. The angle for my second sector will be delta theta sub 2. And the angle for my third sector will be delta theta sub 3. So now I have three sectors and I know the central angle for each one of them in terms of my partition points. So the next thing that I have to do is find the area of each sector of a circle. Our representative element is the sector of a circle, and the pre-calculus formula for finding the area of a circle is 1 half times the central angle times the square of the radius. So now, for the first, for the first sector, we're going to have the following, and I'll write this at the very bottom. So we're going to write 1 half times the angle will be delta theta sub 1, and what about the radius? The radius of the first sector, as you can see, is here that I'm trying to show you now in black. And we can find what the radius of the first sector is by evaluating our polar equation r is equal to f of theta at the partition point theta sub 1. Because you can see this point is on the graph of our polar equation, and if you evaluate the polar equation r is equal to f of theta at theta sub 1, you will get r, or the distance this point is from the pole, and that is, of course, the radius of our first sector. So you can get the radius of the sector, which we need for this pre-calculus formula, by evaluating our polar equation at the right endpoint of the first subinterval, theta sub 1. And you're going to repeat the process for the second and the third sectors. So for the second sector, you're going to have 1 half times the, sec the angle of the second sector is given by delta theta sub 2, the width of the second sub-interval, and then the radius of the second sector is given by the r-coordinate of this point, which is on your polar curve, and you will evaluate the polar curve at theta sub 2 to get the radius of the second sector, so f of 0.5.
theta sub 2. And then f you repeat the process for the third sector. You have 1 half times the angle for the third sector is delta theta sub 3, the width of the third sub-interval in our partition of the interval from alpha to beta. And then the radius of the third sector is the r coordinate of this point, which is given by evaluating our polar e equation or our polar function at the partition point theta sub 3. So you have f of theta sub 3. So now you're going to write a sum, a Riemann sum, to represent what we have here. And of course, I've used three sectors. You can have n sectors if you want to generalize. Before I go any further, I want to revisit what I have at the bottom of the screen. This is, of course, the radius of the first sector. This is the radius of the second sector. And this is the radius of the third sector. But what are we trying to do? We're trying to write a mathematical expression for the area of each sector. And, of course, when you have the radius, what do you need to do to it? You need to square it, because the formula for the area of a sector of a circle from pre-calculus is one-half times the central angle times the square of the radius. So each of these quantities, f of theta sub 1, f of theta sub 2, and f of theta sub 3, they need to be squared. So when I write my Riemann sum, i goes from 1 to 3, because I have three sectors, and I have 1 half times delta theta sub i times f of theta sub i, and I have to square f of theta sub i. Why? Because that's coming from our pre-calculus formula. And of course, although I drew three sectors, you can have more than three. You can have any number of them and sectors to generalize. Is this a Riemann sum? It is. Uh, you can see that I have delta theta sub i, with, and so you have from i is equal to 1 to n, and I can rearrange the factors in my uh, ith term of our sum. So I have 1 half times f of theta sub i squared delta theta sub i. And this is a Riemann sum. because we have a sum of products and one factor is delta theta sub i. For your reference, this is the definition of a Riemann sum, and you see that here. And you can see that you have a sum of products and one factor is delta x sub i, in our case delta theta sub i. And you can read that the definition begins with defining a partition of the interval from a to b. And that's what we have right now. So what we have now is an approximation for the area of our region of interest using a partition of the interval from alpha to beta uh, with n subintervals. And on each subinterval, we have a sector of a circle. And this Riemann sum gives us the sum of the areas of the n sectors. So the next thing that we want to do is take the limit of this Riemann sum as the norm of our partition approaches zero. In other words, as the width of the largest subinterval, whatever that largest subinterval may be from our partition, approaches zero, which is equivalent to saying that the number of subintervals will approach infinity. And if that limit exists, by definition, that gives us a definite integral. And how do we know that the limit will exist? It is sufficient to know that the integrand is a continuous function. In a continuity of the integrand implies integrability. So we now write the limit of the Riemann sum, the limit as the norm of the partition approaches zero of this Riemann sum. From i is equal to 1 to n of 1 half times f of theta sub i squared 
delta theta sub i. And if that limit exists, by definition, we get a definite integral, and our definite integral will be from alpha to beta, those are the limits of integration, corresponding to our radial lines, alpha and beta, which form boundaries of our polar region. And of course, we have this one-half, which is a constant, so I can write that outside of the integral. And then the integrand will be f of theta squared, and we are integrating with respect to theta. So we have d theta. And this is the integration formula for finding the area of a region bounded by a polar curve and two radial lines. One half times the definite integral from alpha to beta, and the integrand is the square of your polar equation, and you're integrating with respect to theta. And we derived it as you just saw. So for your reference, I'd like to show you the definition of a definite integral. You can see that a definite integral is the limit of a Riemann sum as the norm of the partition approaches zero if that limit exists. And knowing that your integrand is a continuous function is a sufficient condition to know that the limit will exist. So we just did objective one. You will understand the development of the integration formula for finding the area of a region bounded by a polar curve and two radial lines. And now we will take a look at objective two. You will be able to write a definite integral to find the area of a region bounded by a polar curve and two radial lines. This was our work for objective one, and this was our end result, our integration formula that gives us the area of a region bounded by a polar curve and two radial lines. That result is stated in your textbook as theorem 10.13, area in polar coordinates. If you have a function, a polar function, a polar equation, that is continuous and non-negative on the interval from alpha to beta, and look at this particular condition. All that's stating, if you rewrite the inequality, is this, that alpha is less than beta, and beta is less than alpha plus 2 pi. In other words, uh, you're not going to have a situation where you have uh, a, an angle of rotation that's something like this. Uh, you don't want this to be alpha, and you don't want to have an angle of rotation that's more than 2 pi radians. That's all that's saying here. You want an angle of rotation that's uh, less than 2 pi radians. And, and beta is greater than alpha. So that's what that's saying. That's what, that's, that is what that is saying. Then the area of the region bounded by the graph of the polar equation between the radial lines theta is equal to alpha and theta is equal to beta is given by this definite integral and we saw how we arrive at that. And of course f of theta is, another way you can write that is r because r is given by f of theta, whatever that rule may be, r squared. Uh, there is a note here that you want to be aware of because you want to make sure that your function is continuous and non-negative on this entire interval. Look at the note. You can use the same formula to find the area of a region bounded by the graph of a continuous non-positive function. However, the formula is not necessarily valid if the function takes on both positive and negative values uh, in the interval from alpha to beta because that would mess up the, the derivation that we, we did earlier to come up with this formula, and you can think about why that might be the case. So we will conclude by looking at an example for objective two. You will be able to write a definite integral to find the area of a region bounded by a polar curve and two radial lines. We will take a look at number one, which is in fact one of the problems from your homework for tonight. Write an integral that represents the area of the shaded region shown in the figure. 
do not evaluate the integral. So our polar equation is given. Our polar equation is r is equal to f of theta, and f of theta is 2 times sine of theta. Look at the region that is shaded, because we want to write an integral that represents the area of the shaded region shown. Uh, we just want to write the integral. So the, the shaded region is the left half of the circle, and the circle is the graph of the polar equation. r is equal to 2 times sine of theta. So you have to understand how this polar region is bounded. It is bounded by the graph of this polar equation and two radial lines. You need to know what your two radial lines are so you can form your limits of integration correctly. The first radial line is the radial line theta is equal to pi over 2. And the second radial line, so here's the first radial line theta is equal to pi over 2. And the second radial line is the radial line theta is equal to pi. Here's the second radial line, theta is equal to pi. And of course, here you have the graph of the polar equation. So this region that I shaded earlier in blue is bounded by the green and the gold radial lines. And how do I know those are the correct radial lines? Because you're looking at these two points, points A and B that are on your polar curve. Point A has polar coordinates r theta where theta is equal to pi over 2 and r is equal to 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, 2 times 1 is 2. Point B has polar coordinates r theta where theta is equal to pi and r is equal to 0. Sine of pi is 0 and 2 times 0 is 0. So to trace this portion of the curve, we're starting at theta is equal to pi over 2, and we're ending at theta is equal to pi. So that is why the two radial lines that form boundaries of this region are theta is equal to pi over 2, and theta is equal to pi. So our half circle, our semicircle is bounded by these two radial lines and the graph of our polar equation. Once you understand that, you just go ahead and write the definite integral by using the formula for area of area in polar coordinates, which is going to be one half times the definite integral from the limits of integration will be from pi over 2 to pi from pi over 2 to pi. The integrand will be the polar equation, which is 2 sine theta. And of course, you have to square that. And you have integration with respect to theta. That's as much as you need to do for this problem, because it says uh, write an integral that represents the area of the shaded region shown in the figure. Do not evaluate the integral. But of course, if you wanted to evaluate, you would want to simplify the integrand a little bit. 2 squared is 4, and then you have sine squared theta. Uh, and we will talk about how you can do this integration problem later. Uh, you can factor out the 4, and you will have to replace sine squared theta with a, trig, uh, with a trigonometric expression using a trig identity. The trig identity you would use is called a power reducing formula, and then you would continue from there. But today we just wanted to focus on writing the definite integral, and we can talk about evaluating later. So in today's lesson, we looked at objectives 1 and 2. Objective 2, you will be able to write a definite integral to find the area of a region bounded by a polar curve and two radial lines. It's important for you to understand how the polar region is bounded so that you can get the correct limits of integration.